I first met Chris Uma about 12 years ago. Chris was a doctor. He was a general practitioner working in Nairobi, Kenya. At the time, Chris's practice was being affected by the AIDS pandemic. Chris was seeing HIV and AIDS decimate Kenya. In the 80s and 90s, in the 1980s and 1990s, the life expectancy in Kenya dropped from the mid 60s to the low 40s. And around Africa, millions of people were dying from AIDS every year. And here's the thing the medication to, to prolong those people's lives was available, but it was just too expensive for people in a country where the health system was all but non existent and the average annual income was just a couple of dollars a day. Chris and I were at a conference and he said, I had a, I had a patient, a school teacher, who contracted AIDS related meningitis. Now, the medication exists and it could save him, but it costs $14 a day. We gave him the prescription, he went away. In two weeks he came back because he needed another prescription. And he used up all his savings. He went away again with his prescription and bought two more weeks of medication. He came back, he sold all his furniture, everything in his house. Chris said, I had to tell him to stop, to stop buying the medicine. I had to tell him, don't sell your house. I had to tell him, you've just got a plan for your funeral. And Chris said, I'm a doctor. I want to treat patients. I don't want to plan funerals. This was happening over and over and over again in Africa, all around Sub-Saharan Africa. Millions of people, millions of people were suffering and dying, not because the medicine didn't exist, but because they just couldn't afford to pay for it. We, we had the drugs, we just weren't using them to help the number of people who needed them. How could this happen? How in the world would we let this happen? Were we so callous and indifferent that we would let people die by the millions, let countries and communities be decimated? When we saw and we knew that a modern plague was attacking them and we were not doing anything. Science and scientists had worked by the time I met Chris to figure out a way to be able to control the pandemic. They figured out how triple therapy antiretrovirals or ARVs could, could work. It meant that for people who were HIV positive here in North America and Western Europe, they were living. But in Africa, people were still dying. Clearly, science was not enough on its own to help the world's poorest people. Because for that, we needed cross-pollinization. We needed interdisciplinary action. We needed the scientists to develop the diagnostic tools to analyze what the virus and develop the drugs to fight this disease. But even though I, at the time, when I was working with Doctors Without Borders, we were working with doctors, we knew that we would need many, many others to fight this. Lawyers, activists, diplomats, concerned citizens. We would need a global people's movement to bring these scientific discoveries to the poorest people in the world. At Médecins Sans Frontières, we decided we would have to go on the offensive. We could do nothing until the price of medicine came down. We had discussions with the drug companies, and when those came to nothing, to not, we had to have a true two-pronged offensive. First of all, we would work on shame. We would publicly go on the offensive, talk about injustice, talk about inequality, and try to shame the drug companies into lowering the price. And when even that didn't work, we took even another tack, which people don't expect from NGOs. We became, we, we made ourselves into ultra-capitalists. We said, what we need here is competition. If there's gonna be a way to bring the prices down, the market forces are gonna bring it down, it has to be through competition. And that means 
we have to be able to override the patents on the, on, on the AIDS medicine. We were talking to generic, company, generic drug companies who were happy with this as well because they saw a chance to get into the market. And in Brazil and in India, generic companies were starting and immediately trade sanctions were threatened. Thailand was put under incredible pressure by the government of the United States and by other Western governments not to produce generic medicine. So we realized we also needed a trade strategy. We had to go to the World Trade Organization. We had to get involved there, which was totally new territory for us. But gradually, we could see, that both in the diplomatic discussions and also in the public forum, that our, our issues were starting to gain traction. That we knew they were gaining traction because of some of the arguments against us. It was, well, you know, if we make medicine cheaper for Africans, it means we're not going to have enough money to research the medicine that you guys in the rich world really want to have. They said, oh, you know, Africans don't really know how to take the medicine. They won't be able to do it. Their health system is just too weak. You know, it's just not going to work. And anyhow, they said, any retrovirals, they're not a cure. We just prolong life. And I've come to tell you, I really notice that people who aren't sick are quick to tell other people that something's just a cure. It's not, it's not a cure. It's just going to help them for a little while. Because those antiretrovirals have the potential for people, well, to live almost as long lives as you were talking about, Prabhu, when it works. And finally, finally, after a few years, the trade deal went through, the Doha Declaration. There was exceptions made for health emergencies, and the AIDS pandemic was considered a health emergency. And when that happened, that cost of medicine was too expensive for that man in Nairobi, which was about a Canadian dollars at the time. It was about $14,000 per person per year. Within a year, it had fallen to $500 once the generic companies were able to start producing and didn't have to worry about trade sanctions. And today, that cost has kept going down, and so it's about, depends on the country, but about $150, $180 per person per year. Now, now, the medicine is affordable. What we did say at the time was, particularly on the issue of health systems, in fact, the pharmaceutical companies were right. There were concerns that the African health system was too weak too corrupt, was not going to be able to deliver the medicine. So one of the things that we decided we had to do was show that medicine, that AIDS programs could be delivered in the most remote parts of Africa, they could be delivered successfully, that patients would adhere, and that we could transfer those programs over to the local health system. That's why a few years later, I found myself on the shores of Lake Mueru. Lake Mueru is a lake that in the north, it's where the paved road ends in Zambia, and it's on the border between Zambia and the Democratic Republic of Congo. And we were going to an island in the middle of the lake, it's in the middle of Africa, to show that it was possible to deliver antiretrovirals in this circumstance. You get up early in the morning, you get a long boat, 75 horsepower on the back. I'll tell you, Lake Mueru reminds me nothing so much as going in Georgian Bay, going out to an island in Georgian Bay. Except our backpacks were, didn't have camping gear, our backpacks were filled with patient files, and our coolers didn't have sandwiches and drinks. Our coolers had medicine and, and uh, reagents, everything that we would need to be able to trade. And instead of the beautiful rocks and pines that we have in Georgian Bay and the Canadian Shield, it was also beautiful that it was big, big palm trees, tall elephant grass, and you could see the tops of the thatched houses that were on, that were on the island of Kilwa. We came up to one of the villages, set up our clinic. We were doing this every week. We went into the house, into the house where the clinic was, and right over where the rafters, where the rafters in the house were, you could see there were beds, there was uh, there were two beds, and there was a table because normally this was somebody's house, it was their bedroom, so they put everything up there so that we could 
talk to the patients, we can see our patients, consult with them. Some people were coming for testing, others were coming for follow-up visits. And our doctor, Andrea, worked away with them. Then she said, it's time to go. We've got to go and uh, we have one bedridden, bedridden a housebound patient who we have to see. And so we went off through the village. I don't know how many of you have had the pleasure of walking through a village in Africa. But it seems to me that every time you go walking suddenly, as a four year at the head of a parade, because there's first five and then 10 and then 20 kids are all there to feel you, people to, to, to touch you, to feel your skin and to see where you're going. We walked through the village, people were mending nets, cooking fish over open fires. We got to, it was very hot. We got into, got into the house, to the house. We went inside through the low door. Suddenly in there, it was cool. Andrea started talking with the patient there, the woman. She wants to make sure she's been adhering to the regimen properly of the drugs. And the woman went back, brought out, brought out the pills, showed them to us. And Andrea said, have you told your husband that you're HIV positive? The woman said, no. No. Andrea said, why? Why? What's the matter? Why haven't you told him? Oh, I just decided that, oh, well, he doesn't Surely, surely he knows because he come here and he sees us coming. No, he knows I was sick, he knows I'm getting better, he doesn't want to. What are you afraid of? said Andrea. The woman said, I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid. But she won't tell her husband. What was so right and logical to us in our medical system? would make no sense at all to that woman. Because even though I'm 99.9% sure that it was her husband who infected her, if she were to tell her husband that she was HIV positive, he would be able to kick her out of the house. He would be able to kick her off the island. She'd have to go to the town of Kashkishi. She'd never left that island in her life. And what chance would an HIV positive woman have in the middle of Zambia? And so what was so right to her, to us, made no sense in her eyes. We went back to the, uh, we went back to the clinic where people had come and people were getting tested. We, we had these rapid parachecks. This one is actually from malaria, but we had five people who were waiting outside. We had their blood, we put their blood there, we put on a reagent, like this, and you wait. Up here, there's a space. If one line appears, then you know it's working. And within about five minutes, the second line appears, the person has a good chance of being HIV positive. So we took them, they were mixed. We went to the next room. Laid them out on the table, five of them. All the talking we've been doing about the day stopped as we watched. One line appeared in all five. And we waited. Five, six minutes passed. No other line appeared. None of those people were HIV positive. And that, I can assure you, was a wonderful wonderful end to, to a remarkable day. Many people, many people in Kashkishi, on Kilwa, were afraid when it was time for us to go. When we were going and handing over to the local, to the local health system, they didn't want us to go. And that was a question. Would the health system be strong enough to be able to deliver those medicines themselves, and, and, and the answer has been yes. Because in the years since then, we have seen that HIV positive people and their families and their communities were able to lobby their own governments to invest more in the health system, to make sure the health system was less, less corrupt. And now, I can't 
think of the number of clinics I've been in, in rural places around Africa where you go in and you see, yes, the medicine is there. Yes, here's some volunteer pharmacy students who are helping make to distribute it. Yes, here's an outreach that's going out to small, to small villages. Not everybody's getting the coverage they should. There still isn't enough. There is always a risk that now the pandemic is coming under control that we may back off and we may say, well, good, that's done. Let's move on to something else. But things are changing in a way that we we could never, never imagine. I remember the first time, thinking back to Chris Uma, in just a decade, those remarkable changes. I want to finish with one more story. This one's about me. When my youngest son was born, my wife and I were working at a project in Santo Domingo in the Dominican Republic. We were living in the shanty towns of Santo Domingo. Her pregnancy was very, very hard. And we feared for her life, and we feared for the life of, of the baby. We wanted to come home, we wanted to come back to our medical system, but we were trapped. And for month after month, we'd call home, and our, our doctor would say, no, you can't come home, because the risk of the flight and pressurization of the flight is greater than just staying there and sent to the we didn't know what was going to happen. She couldn't, she couldn't get out of bed. She was getting sicker and sicker and sicker until finally we hit a point where, the doctor, where our doctor said, it's okay, it's okay. You've got the green light, you can come home. And we flew home. Our son was born here. He barely survived, even with all the medical care that we have in Canada. And if we hadn't come home, I don't think either of We had this. We had this Canadian passport. We could come home. We could come home to a medical system that, which is as good as any system in the world. And it's just the luck of the draw that I've got a Canadian passport. It's pure luck of the draw that my parents came here and I got to be born here and that Alex was born in Canada as well. And I cannot explain how it is my family gets to be healthy while another one does not just because I'm Canadian. I cannot explain how it is that I got to be educated in this wonderful, wonderful school. But I do know that I cannot turn away just because someone lives in another part of the world, just because I may not know his name, just because she's another color that I might be. I cannot turn away. All of us, all of us in this room, for whatever, all the different skills we have, we have immense power not to turn away, but to act. And that's what I ask of you. Think of interdisciplinary, think of, think of cross-pollinization. Whatever you do, science, medicine, engineering, journalism, politics, activism, the law, whatever you do, don't turn away. Make the world a better place. It's not too much to ask. And that choice of action is yours. Thank you.